Second Life. Kathy Kaiser is Senior Manager for Academic Outreach and ITS Teaching and Learning. And Larry Taylor is a graduate student in the School of Information and Library Science. Thank you all for coming today and joining us in this tour of Second Life. What we'd like to do today is, from the teaching and learning perspective, is understand what we'd like to learn from Second Life, understand what we'd like to um, develop in a UNC Chapel Hill community in Second Life, and we're hoping that we can develop some sort of community of interest around Second Life based on our discussions here. First of all, what is Second Life? Second Life is a virtual environment. It's not a game. It's a, a virtual environment. It's a network environment where people create accounts. They create avatars. They dress their avatars. They give them names. And then the avatars go out into the Second Life world. The avatars interact with other avatars, people, whatever. It's not scripted in any way. The same kinds of activities that can take place in real life also take place in Second Life. Imagine it and it can happen in Second Life. From our perspective, from teaching and learning, we're focusing on the teaching and learning aspects of Second Life. Um, Second Life is operated by a company called Linden Labs. Just to give you an idea of the scope, there are over 3.7 million residents. A resident is one of the avatars in Second Life. Over 3. million residents in Second Life right now. Um, at any given time, I didn't check Larry when we logged on, but yesterday about this time there were 30,000 people logged on at one point. 1.3 million have logged on in the last 30 days. So this is a big thing. There's a lot of people interested in this. Um, why do we care about this? Well, again, from a teaching and learning perspective, we want to understand how this might be used in teaching and learning. I'll ask Larry to speak in a minute what his perspective is. But from, um, through uh, funding from the Vice Chancellor for Information Technology, we in Teaching and Learning, headed up by Charlie Green, our Assistant Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning, purchased some space in Second Life. The, the virtual space is called an island. We purchased the island, and we're just in the beginning process of building that island up. Um, and let's see, Larry, do you want to talk a little bit? And what we want to find out is how we can use this in teaching and learning. Um, Harvard, MIT, Princeton, um, big institutions are using this as a teaching and learning environment. And we want to understand how we can use it here at Chapel Hill. And Larry has a slightly different perspective. Well, it's also a wonderful environment for research. I'm doing my master's paper on Second Life, got my IRB approved. And I'm sure uh, they had some second thoughts about it. About <laughs> what does anonymity mean when you're talking about an avatar? Um, yeah, and the uh, the research uh, spans the entire spectrum. Uh, you see research and economics. A lot of business schools are doing research there because there is a, a very quick turnaround of marketing research. Uh, of course. You know, psychology, sociology, and information science is also involved in research in Second Life. Uh, it, it, as a matter of fact, it's become such an intense research environment that the Linden Labs used to have a policy, we have to approve your research before you can proceed. It just got to be too much for them, and they just said, okay, if you have your IRB, you're fine, go for it. <laughs> One of the things I discovered when I first um, Oops, I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Larry, she didn't mean to be One of the first things I discovered when I, when I um, created an avatar in Second Life, and Charlie remembers this day, because I said, oh my god, I can't believe what just happened. I created an avatar. I'm not a game player person. I don't like board games. I don't like any kind of games unless it's a sport. I went into Second Life. I stumbled uh, into a class, a class where you learn how to build things in Second Life. The whole world is created by its residents. They're given space, and then they create things. The whole world is created by the residents. So I stumbled into a class on how to build something very simple in Second Life. The instructor greeted me and said, are you here for the class? I'm like, uh, it, typing in chat, because all the exchanges through chat. You'll see this in a minute. She, she asked me if I was there for the class. I said, uh, she said, oh, come on, join, it. it'll be, join us, it'll be fun. She said, the, the materials are in the blue ball spinning above your head. So anything's possible in Second Life. My avatar looked up, grabbed the materials, and I had the materials. 
and I began taking part in this class. Different avatars became, uh, began joining the class. I could see that I was the newbie. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. There are other people who are moving right along. My avatar could spin around and look and see that I was the slow one. So I was, and I was embarrassed. That was, you know. <laughs> and the instructor had to rein in those who were much quicker or were doing things wrong or were just goofing off in class. The instructor was, was having to you know, call those people down, you know, call them by name, chatting. You know, stop that. You have to stay with the class. The class won't work. So the same kind of dynamics that I've witnessed time and time again in real life classrooms were taking place in the second life classroom. And I said, and I hollered into Charlie. I said, Charlie, you won't believe what just happened. It's the most incredible thing. This is like a classroom. And then I realized that I think we'd be foolish not to further explore what this could do for teaching and learning. So what we're going to do today is take you on a little tour. It's so big and so huge. There's so much to learn and see and do in Second Life. We're just going to gloss <laughs> over the very tip top. We're going to give you a real quick tour of what we've done so far on the Chapel Hill Island. And then I'm going to turn over to Larry, who's going to take us on a different guided tour of some other spaces, some library spaces. Uh, we're going to go to Ohio State. Um, let's see, what else? We're going to talk about what, where this might go in the future. The Sills Building. The Sills Building. And, and no. Information Island, important place. Exactly. So I'm going to stand up. <laughs> I love the way these avatars can move. And I'm going to fly. This is one way we get around in Second Life. And I'm going to fly over here to a landmark you'll recognize. The place I was sitting, that was um, a, a real quick and dirty attempt at the Forest Theater. It's going to be built up in a more grand fashion. But. So right here, we have the Old Well. And for, for people who are just visiting campus, new to Chapel Hill, we just have a, a picture of the Old Well and what it will look like when everything is totally complete. So that's at one end of the island thus far. We are purchasing another island. We're in the process of purchasing another island that will extend beyond this island. So here, we have South Building. You can tell because it's labeled. And it looks like South Building. These are actually real textures, real South Building textures that have been uploaded and applied to the building. And if you peek inside, we can get a better look on the other side, but if you can peek inside, you see there's actually floor plans of, of South Building. So we're just going to quickly fly around to the other side. <coughs> and here, we're just going to walk inside South Building real quick to show you a building under construction. As I mentioned, we're just building. Um, we're just beginning the, in the building phase right now, so we have a lot of work to do. When we go to Ohio State, you'll see what a completed campus looks like. They began their process about a year ago. So here's South Building under construction. You can see through outside of the old well on the other side. <coughs> Right in front of me is a little uh, welcome sign that, again, greets, the, um, greets visitors to, new to Chapel Hill and tells them what we're doing, what we'd like to do. And then further on beyond that, the blue and green um, markers that you see are kind of construction markers for this, I think. Tell me if I'm not mistaken, the blue and the green, that's the center of the island? The yeah. elevation. In elevation. So these are construction um, markers for us as we build the island. They'll go away when we when we finish our work. And down here... How do you move your avatar? Do you have a joystick or what? Great question. I meant to talk about that. I'm using the, the arrow keys and on um, um, PCs, it's a page up, page down to fly. So that's exactly right. And I don't know, does anybody in here know if, if you can use a joystick? I imagine you could. I don't know. I don't know. I think you could. Is anyone in here a regular resident of Second Life? A couple, but not too many. Okay. Okay, I'm going to 
land down here, where we see Uskala. <laughs> now one thing you'll notice is that uh, you have two modes of communications in Second Life, chat, and chat, the way chat works is that anyone within uh, a virtual distance of about 50 to 100 yards can hear your chat. And um, further away, and, and they, it simply is invisible to them. And I can also IM uh, Kathy if I wanted to have a private conversation. This is a feature that can be very useful in a classroom or a meeting situation. You might want to say something to the speaker and only have him hear that question, or you would want to broadcast it to everyone who was there in that place. So you have those two modes. And according to the CEO, Rosedale, Philip Rosedale, Skype is coming to Second Life this year. And um, residents are, are frankly conflicted about that. They could see some real usefulness for having uh, a voice, and you could also have complete chaos and cacophony. So, uh, but it is coming and will be used, and we'll see. They're probably abused. Kathy, <laughs> why is your hand flickering? Like it's a high it has a ring on it. <laughs> it has my engagement ring on it. Yeah. So I'm going to say, uh, let me show you Wilson Library. And of course, the typing is one reason why things in such a way tend to take time. And we'll walk up to uh, the door. This door has got a script. Everything in this library was uh, constructed out of primitives. <laughs> yes, uh, Kathy's what's called a newbie, and sometimes newbie. newbies have a hard time moving around in Second Life. It's one of the things you have to learn how to do. And that's what uh, building consists of, is learning how to um, link these prims together to make whatever you want to make. Uh, you can also add textures, that's why uh, you can see things that are actually based on photographs of this building. As a matter of fact, everything here has a texture, I think except for the doors, I, I didn't use a texture of the actual door out there. And uh, prims can contain scripts so that they can move and do things like <coughs> they can close the door. And on the floor you can see that we have a, a, a yellow marble that's kind of like the marble here, but not quite. We'll probably actually put a texture based on the actual marble here in Wilson. And then beyond Wilson to the south is the bell tower. Wilson is only very, very partially complete. Of course, none of the interior has been done yet, and there's lots of things yet to do on the exterior as well, but uh, it's, it's well under, and, and I've been working on it for about a week, I think, something like that. Can we look up at the <coughs> bell tower? Maybe. Oops. I'm, I'm using Charlie's computer here. We can look up at the bell tower in a minute. Yeah, if, if you bring your view and get your, uh, your view control That's going. Yeah. yeah, the camera camera controls. And just, you just you want to look up at what's completed here, Charlie? Or the bell tower. Oh, at the bell tower? And then spin it around. Yeah. yeah. And the details on the bell tower will, will become better as we get closer. Some things aren't showing up just because of the distance. And the clock works. <laughs> it's on Pacific Standard Time, which is called Second Life Time. I keep uh, arguing for Chapel Hill Time. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Should we fly over to Yes, let's fly over to the bell tower and take a closer look at it. So the clock is an example of um, combining prims with uh, scripts. The scripting language in Second Life is called Linden Scripting Language, or LSL. Uh, it's very similar to C+. And eventually, I hope to have the bells actually chiming uh, throughout the entire island. And Second Life sound will only uh, carry about 100 yards. So it's not difficult to put sound in these bells. Uh, but we'll have to actually put a script and objects all over the island so that when the bells chime, you'll be able to hear it wherever you are. 
come just above y'all, come down. Here we go. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> now notice, notice that I bumped into uh, Kathy there. Um, there is a lot of physicality that's built into the program. And as a matter of fact, you can give Prim's what's called physics. And, uh, and when you do that, uh, you, know, <coughs> you know, Newton reigns supreme when you add physics. If I were to create a block here, it would just float in midair. If I added physics, it would drop like a, like a block. <laughs> okay, so let's go down to the face of the tower. Uh-oh, sorry. <laughs> and, um, and actually, let's, let's go down to the very base. This is the little balcony. This building. this building is truly iconic in that uh, I doubt it will have any kind of <laughs> classroom functions. Now, uh, Kathy just demonstrated that some of these things are what they call phantoms. You can walk right through walls. Did you see that? Try walking through that wall there, Kathy. There she goes. And the reason uh, that that was done is because so that you could fly in through this opening, which is done with uh, Photoshop or GIMP using alpha channels to make um, things that are solid be transparent. And uh, unfortunately, you just can't make that, that the opening transparent. You make the opening in that whole <coughs> crim, which is actually a cube transparent, uh, or phantom, and you can just walk her right through it. A little unnerving. But she banged her head out the top of it. Because that was a non-phantom crim that she hit. She hit the, the, the top part, and that's a solid one. So you have um, both kinds. So, Kathy, why don't we, um, at this point, see what a uh, fully realized university campus looks like. I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to transport to, uh, to uh, Ohio University. It's not Ohio State, it's actually Ohio University. And, um, and I will send her what's called a TP. A teleport. A teleport. There's lots of jargon in Second Life. You're facing me, right, Kathy? Because I want yep. to, to see what happens when I tell us work. So he just disappeared? And I'm now in, uh, at Ohio University, and I'm going to send <coughs> Kathy a teleport. And I'm able to do that because she's on my friends list. There is a lot of uh, the social networking aspects to Second Life as well. And see, I see you have a little message up here. I'm just going to click teleport. Off I go. <coughs> Do you have a problem with loading time? That's one of the problems that I've had using this, is that it takes forever to move and not highlight. I think it depends on the graphics card. It graphics depends card. a tremendous amount on the graphics card. If you have a um, NVIDIA card of kind of the latest uh, uh, version, then you will find things go a lot faster, things look better. Uh, much depends on your graphics, it depends whether you have good, uh, enough memory on your, uh, on your computer. Um, I find that network connectivity, I, I've never tried to do it over a dial-up, but I, I use Roadrunner, it seems to work fine. So that doesn't seem to be the big factor. Okay, so we're now at Ohio University, they put up a little marker here. And I've never been to the Ohio University campus, so I really don't know if this is what it looks like or not. No, it has a college gateway. Okay. And we're going to go to the uh, student center first. Somebody. We did run into somebody earlier today. We chatted with them for a little while. 
what you find is that uh, when they hold classes here, it can be quite crowded. I've been here where there have been you know, 30, 40 avatars attending a class. Other times, it might be uh, not, not you know, populated very much at all. I'm just going to do a quick spin around so you get an idea of what, what's there. Yeah. We're, I'm thinking about doing something similar uh, to this in Wilson, where uh, you'll go in, there'll be an iconic foyer. I was, I was telling Lisa about this. And then beyond that, though, it can open up and you could have something that looks like this uh, extending in the back. Because it's hard for avatars to move in confined spaces. Because your camera is literally floating behind your head about 12 feet away. If you're in a small hallway or a room, literally your camera can go behind a wall and Which suddenly you you're blind. And, and so uh, having uh, amphitheaters and large auditoriums becomes a real advantage. And notice that Ohio did not use steps in this section. I really, uh, avatars can negotiate ramps much better than stairs. <laughs> and you never fall down, at least on stairs. On stairs, Yes? I noticed you, uh, you move the camera separate from your character. Yes, you can. the camera move. <laughs> so would it be possible to position that camera to look through the avatar's eyes? Oh yes, it's called mouse look. Uh, and Kathy, what you can, yeah, there it is. So now it's, yeah. Which to me, personally, this gets me really dizzy. <laughs> what, what was the question? Can, the question was, can't you um, position the camera so that it's from the perspective of your avatar? Look into your avatar's eyes, which is what I'm doing right now. Personally, it makes me a little woozy. It's called mouse look, is what they call it. Quick question. The islands, is there a limit on the number of prints? Oh, yes. Um, is that a problem? That is a big problem. Uh, most uh, residents, when they come to Second Life, if you become a premium member, you buy uh, the smallest amount of land, you buy is 512 square meters. You can put 117, isn't that right, Charlie? Prims on that land. And so prim budgeting, there are actually classes that I've attended on prim budgeting. You, you, you get creative because you can build something that takes up a lot of prims or you build the same thing and look almost identical with very few. And those are the tricks of the trade that you want to learn. I'm a rookie builder right now. I'm learning from the masters. Yeah, is it 15,000 square meters? No, 15,000 prims. Oh, 15,000 prims on the entire island. I'm, I'm you and season island. Like, would that chair be a prim or the table, or is it like, or is that Yeah, why don't you right click on a chair and show them how many prims are in it? The right click and edit it. There, 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 you, you see the prims right there. That one looks like it's got, that's a lot of prims in that chair. About 10 or 11, 12 prims? 4, 5, 4, 5, 4, 5, 6, 7, Okay, so at this point, uh, let's uh, go out the back here and fly over to the uh, art gallery. <coughs> lift up and fly directly over the top of this building, back to where we started, just to save time. <laughs> Did you get caught in the tree? Oh, there you are. You're ahead of me. I'm behind you. I'll be right there. There we go. I actually met the instructor of this class. I, I was uh, looking the island over. She had the class in there. I'd like I say, about uh, I think there were about 20 students, and uh, they were conducting a class on how to uh, put up a uh, exhibit like this. This is all student art. This is all student art. 
Well, I don't know if I'd call it art. I think it's a documentary exhibit is what it really is. Yeah, uh, uh, Kathy, why don't you come over and take a look at this. Uh, yeah, this explains it, this uh, sign here. It's a multimodal fusion of literature, visual art, and digital media. A gallery installation, an online environment, and book. That is all there and quite well developed, even though I think it will develop even further. Um, one of the things when you become a member of Second Life is you, you sign off on a covenant of sort yeah. um, to behave yourself. And when you don't behave yourself, it's called griefing and can literally get you booted from Second Life. And one thing that Kathy did not mention is the fact that there is an adult Second Life, where we are now, and a teen Second Life, or TSL. Yeah. Adults cannot be in teen. Second right. lot. It's even, it would be difficult for me as a graduate student to get permission to go there. And that's for uh, yeah. uh, 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 young people between 13 and 17. I'm thinking of something a little bit deeper question about, about you know, whether Like a society character. kind of thing? Yeah, whether uh -huh. you're really creating society or simply a, a little bit of architecture and, and uh, more limited. So if you, if there are an experiment with different ways, designs of property rights for dealing with, you know, you know a society, say, it's dealing with climate change. <laughs> or yeah. something like that. Um, there is lots of community uh, interaction. Uh, there was actually, early on in Second Life's history, a, uh, a kind of a Boston Tea Party uh, where uh, people got together and protested the Linden's decisions and uh, threw something in the bay. And, um, and, and these kind of things uh, continued. And, and, uh, this is one thing about Second Life that I think is different from the web. And if you go to a website, you're not going to establish a relationship. When you go to Second Life, especially because it's bl Google is blind to Second Life, you put a bot on these 3D uh, prints and you get nothing. And so in order to learn how to do things, you uh, create relationships. And um, it takes time, but it can be extremely uh, uh, useful, and you can really learn things very quickly if you find the right people. And of course, information seeking is a big thing in Second Life. I was going to say, as a matter of fact, before Larry and I ever met face to face, I met him in Second Life. Another librarian from Michigan or somewhere said, "Oh, Scholar's is the one you want to talk to in Chapel Hill." So I, I, I contacted Larry, and he set me, he helped me set up um, audio streaming on the on the UNC Chapel Hill Island. We did that all via Second Life, and I think we met face-to-face -face the next night or something. Yeah, that's a good example, because last week we did the first lecture from SILS into Second Life. Gary Marcinini did a lecture on surrogation, avatars are surrogates. And, uh, and so while he was doing this lecture there in Manning Hall, he was also lecturing to about 20 avatars in Second Life on Information Island. And it was interesting, because I was in the audience in Second Life, and I could see Larry's avatar on stage doing tech support. It was very <laughs> odd. <laughs> okay, why don't we go over to Information Island and see the Sills building. There's the door. This place is a bit of a labyrinth. I've, I've gotten lost in here before. Okay. How do you tell it where to go? Well, we're going to, uh, uh, Kathy's going to show you one way, and that is you do a search. Search for SILS. Place. S I L S. Right? Mm -hmm. Search. Searching, searching, searching. Searching. This worked earlier. There we go. So we search for SILS. We see the place where we're about to go. And now I'm going to go ahead and. Are you up there already? I'm going to uh, go ahead and teleport there. I'm going to teleport there as well. That means how many people have been to that place? In, in what time? It varies. I think that's maybe in the last two weeks. That's something I need to find out exactly what the time uh, period is. I think, I think it's daily. You think it's daily? It is daily. Okay. That's not bad for daily. Um, the, the question, um, answering the question further about how you can navigate somewhere, 
you can also, there's the notion of landmarks, which is similar in the World Wide Web to bookmarks. So once you've been someplace you want to remember, you set a landmark there, and that gets stored in what's called your inventory. And then you can always go back into your inventory, look for that landmark, and teleport there again. So it's the same concept <coughs> as um, bookmarks are. This time I landed on the couch. Earlier today, Larry landed on the couch. I need to, I need to change my, my TP place for this building. I don't think that's a good thing to land on the couch. I might be sitting there. Okay, so this is a terminal that I've set up in the um, first floor of the Sills building. This building is a prefab building that was given to a number of libraries. Um, University of Michigan, Indiana, um, UNCG. Um, you'll see these, uh, IBM has one of these buildings. And this was uh, donated by a corporation called Kaltz. And uh, if Kathy touches the terminal, Which you'll see... You did? Oh, there you go. You'll see that I've put some of the digital collections available at UNC on this terminal. And what it does is it takes you to that website. So it's a bit of a translation between the two modalities. And let's go outside and take a look at the azaleas. They're in blue. Like, uh, for example, when we had the uh, lecture being uh, beam from Sills, I put a big poster out in front of the building advertising it. And it's interesting because that's how I found out about it. When I was checking out the Sills building another time, I saw the big postcard outside. Like, if we walk over here to the Michigan Library Consortium, they have a poster up in front of their building. Where they have two posters. Harvard does. Why they not? are building a new building on Information Island 2. This is, uh, this is actually called Cyberry City. Information Island is actually on the next island over. And, and why here? Why still on this island? Because this is the land that was contributed by Palace Corporation. So let's fly up to the IBM building, because I'd like to show you what they're doing in Second Life. It's directly behind, you know, to the north of us. Oh, you haven't got it here. Oh, there you are. Okay. <coughs> IBM owns 23 islands in Second Life. And use uh, the islands for various purposes. And this is a little slideshow that they put together that shows some of their activities. And it's part of their services, science management, and engineering uh, initiative. Uh, NC State, for example, is very involved with this initiative. So there's a full suite of tools available in Second Life 2 for instruction. There's whiteboards, there's um, mm -hmm. pole taking devices, there's um, chart makers, graph, graph makers, there's devices to, to stream audio and so forth. There's, there's a voice way to available. So this looks pretty conventional, what we think right now from IBM. It does. So one would wonder why IBM would be doing things so ordinary. Well, one thing that they do, and you can see from this slide, there's a forbidden city. is that they have created islands that, um, for example, all of their Chinese uh, colleagues meet in the forbidden city in Second Life, and um, you know, apparently this has a lot of cultural ramifications, being able to kind of meet on their turf, so to speak, even if it's virtual. And the CEO of IBM has an avatar and uses this uh, on a regular basis, I've, been, I've read. There's an article in Fortune Magazine, I think it was uh, just this last month, on Second Life, that talks about some of the business uses. Okay, so let's see some of the other institutions and libraries that are in this area. So 
So you saw the Sills building. Here is uh, the Michigan Library Consortium. They, they gave me the idea for the hot tub. For some reason, the hot tubs are much more popular for doing meetings than <laughs> conference tables. <laughs> they bubble, the steam comes up, you feel, you feel relaxed. And, and uh, I found out all sorts of wonderful stuff while in a hot tub meeting. <laughs> this is not a major and, you know, if I could just springboard off that, Larry and I were talking earlier how there seems to be just a little bit of a bridge sometimes between Second Life and real life. You can, you notice when, when like you're around a hot tub place, you hear the bubbles, also you start to relax. Larry was relating an example to me one time when he was on the very tip top of the bell tower and experienced a sense of vertigo <laughs> because he was up so high. You know, I got totally embarrassed in that class. There's, the, watching that little jump between Second Life and real life has been interesting. Okay, so this is the Canadian National Library. There are several national libraries here. There's uh, Illinois, we have a uh, building. Uh, uh, and over here, or uh, I think UNCG is in this group, but one building that uh, is, is very popular is the Australian National Library. They have a camera. I haven't gone down yet. There we go, I'm down. Where'd you go? You go to the middle little courtyard here. You see me on the map? Oh, there you are. You know, the thing is, if you have no sense of direction in real life, you don't get sense. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Australian librarians are known for their great parties. So uh, they're a popular group. And if you turn around, uh, across from us, the Australian library is the uh, University of North Carolina Greensboro. They have a library here, uh, or building as well. We call these a library is really not uh, accurate. <coughs> but they have a presence here. And if you'll notice, um, uh, Kathy, if you look at their front porch, they have litter. Those are prims. It's a cube and a cone. Somebody uh, was practicing creating uh, here, and they just left them. And this becomes a problem for some of the libraries in that if you don't have uh, deed rights, you can't get rid of litter. Um, I got mine because somebody left their hair in my on my first floor. Uh, literally, it was floating in the air above that terminal, their hair. It was, it was a librarian from Battleboro, Vermont. Uh, my name was Sharky. And so, uh, in order to get rid of Sharky's hair, I had to get deed rights, and then I could just click on and say, delete, and it, it went away. And I think UNCG probably doesn't have that capability yet. Cyber litter. Do the other two green dots in your uh, little miniature map indicate people? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there, there are several people here. So you uh, have <laughs> have libraries. Could somebody create a factory and have it, you know, polluting to other people's land? Polluting? <laughs> I think that's more atoms and not bits. Well, I mean, you mentioned people leaving hair around. And that's oh, well, well, there is, there, there are very creative ways that you can do this griefing. There was one case where an entire island was set on fire and, and even the linens couldn't put it out. And it's like you went there and everything was just in flames. <laughs> so. Can you go up to somebody, somebody else who's on this island and talk to see if they want to talk to you? Sure. Can you repeat the questions? Whoops. Yeah. Can we come go up to someone else on the island? So let's go to these people uh, over here to the north and see who, who uh, these folks are. Are they in the building? They're in the building? building. Yeah, it must be in the building. What are they there? So this is a the Glenview Public Library, and Glenn Yao is the avatar who that is their group affiliation that is uh, shows up above their name. And so we can say sorry. <laughs> 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 Sign language in Second Life. Can you get rid of the camera control? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, Glenn could be what's called AFK, away from keyboard. <laughs> so uh, he might not actually be here, even though his avatar is. I know I had a friend of mine who uh, had a guy, and he just, I guess, left his computer on, and his avatar was just in her living room. <laughs> and what they eventually did is they took what's called a push gun and pushed him out of the living room <laughs> and off a dock and into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think Glenn is actually here either. I'm not sure if you log out if your avatar is still there and it's just away. No, it goes away. Are you sure? Most of the time it does, even though, well, sometimes it can be squirrely, yeah, so maybe. Okay, well, you Well, he's apparently not yeah, actually Glenn here. Glenn looks a lot like you. Are there, how many avatar choices are there? You can sculpt your avatar to quite a degree, and the other thing is, is you can also, <laughs> you, you can buy eyeballs, you can buy your hair, you can buy skin. Oh. And you can find all that free, too, you don't have to buy it all. Yeah, but the really good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any suggestions for choosing an avatar and a name? Well, the last name is not one that you can choose. You choose your first name, there's a whole long list of last names. So you know, the diet was not my choice, it was just one I saw. And I said, oh, that sounds nice. And I thought Ariel sounded nice. Yeah. And I went with K and K because they're my initials, my real life initials. Yeah. I wanted to do something that was sort of representative, except for the long blonde hair. And uh, you know, I use Uskala because it's, it's a, it comes from a Native American language, and I, I guess I'm like the code talkers, and I think that's a good security thing. So all of my passwords and everything, my usernames are always. Native American languages, it's not English or anything else. It works well. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. No idea. Yeah, it's actually Choctaw. So what happens, since he wasn't there, when he when he does come back, your dialogue's not sitting there what what for me. If I would have I am'd him when he's not there, it would have waited. Yeah. Okay, so let's leave Glenn to his what, slumbers. No. One thing that happened to me this morning, early this morning when I came in, I went to the old well, no, the bell tower, and I saw an avatar flying around the bell tower that I didn't recognize, so I went to check him out and uh, find out if he was doing anything evil to our bell tower. It turned out to be a, a kid from Germany who just stumbled on our island, and he said, what's cool about this? I said, well, where else can you talk to somebody from North Carolina if you're in Germany? He was near Frankfurt, you know, I said, you know, just stumble on somebody and have a conversation. Yeah, we had an example of that uh, before we did the uh, broadcast last week. It was another lecture by uh, Brad Heminger, and we, I just tried as a practice to broadcast it from the UNC Sills building. And so we were broadcasting, and you could hear if you were there on the building, and literally out of the air dropped in this avatar who was a doctoral candidate in information science from Zagreb. And she listened to most of the uh, lecture and actually had a question for Dr. Hindenburg at the end of it. And uh, we kind of got a kick out of that. You know, just these kind of serendipitous events that can happen easily in the second line. <coughs> so shall we go back to uh, UNC? Have another person. Should we go see if they want right to talk there. to us? Right there. I'm recording the kids' building. Right in front of them. Go get them, Kathy. <laughs> 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 what are you doing? <laughs> Their appearance. Yeah. <laughs> and, and this particular island is near the orientation island, so we, you do get a lot of people flying over this island who are brand new. Why don't you right click on his name and show his profile? We'll see what, what his birth date is. Profile. And he was born. Well, About a month, and he's, okay. he's from the American, he's with the ALA, Washington office. And he's getting his fashion on. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to walk around with, you know, shabby clothes. Okay, should we get back to... Yes, but we want time for uh, questions and answers, I guess. So, let's see, I'll just show, the, I talked about the concept of landmarks earlier. I'll just show one quick way to navigate back in the different landmarks that are set. <coughs> um, Could you uh, bring up the NMC campus and just let us see it on your map, Kathy? Sure. Um, the 
So you, what you do is you go to the uh, Linden Exchange. Uh, give me your credit card and you can buy Lindens. The current exchange rate is, I think, around 270 Lindens per U.S. dollar. Already, there is a Second Life millionaire. It's a land baron. They have land that's worth more than a million dollars U.S., not Lindens, but U.S. And there are various people in Second Life who make six-figure incomes from doing things like building. Animation is a big uh, business in Second Life. Also, the uh, designing of clothing, real big. And so there are malls that have just shop after shop, and you can buy just about anything you can imagine. And it's a, it's a 600,000 to a 1 million US dollar a day economy at this point. And of course, it's growing. However, you can't, you can't exist without putting any of your own money into it. I'm yes. Yes, I was going to say, in order to build anything in the game, to upload textures, to design clothing, you have to have limited dollars. It costs money to upload everything. So if you want to design a pair of tennis shoes and you have four textures you have to upload, that's like 40 linen dollars. So mm -hmm. that's true. Get stuff. It, there's an exchange. Yeah, it's definitely real life currency. I was going to ask if uh, anybody's looked at API within the client for. for for instance, manipulating your avatar, positioning your avatar, and orienting them based on programmatic input and so forth versus keyboard. Yeah, there, there are ways to do that. Um, for example, I like to play the flute. There's a thing called a hyper flute in Second Line that you can. Hmm? Like you um, instruments? Yeah, play? yeah, yeah. I, I'll show you the, yeah. that right now. And the, the idea is that when you have one of these musical instruments. You can play it within Second Life, within the world, but you're restricted to, uh, you know, uh, the mouse for the most part, which is not terribly uh, natural, and, and, and that you can't really play very well. So could you feed a, like a MIDI controller into Second Life, for example? It, well, exactly. I'm going to show you an example of that right now. He's got a flute. Well, actually, no. I'm not, uh, well, you'll, you'll you'll see the flute, but uh, you won't see the heads-up display. You have things in Second Life called HUDs or heads-up displays, and it, they work uh, to a, a, a lesser. And I think uh, if we have sound going, you should hear something. We don't have any sound from the. I'm trying clicking on the little arrow. Maybe we can hear. There. And that's uh, manipulating it with the mouse. And the idea is that you can have a program operating outside on the client side that I can then map my keyboard to the keys of the, of the instrument and play it directly that way. But those are fairly rare so far as uh, from what I can see. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, go ahead. That's I was going to say related to that, are you able to stream real time uh, data into Second Life. So, for example, could you stream the sound of the bells in real time? Yes, okay. and we've done that. Uh, you can do real life audio and video. Uh, and uh, what you do is you have to hire time on what they call a relay server. Um, because if you were to go through, let's say, the, the typical Roadrunner connection, you would only be able to stream to, say, four or five avatars before you would completely exhaust your bandwidth. So you hire these um, relay servers that can handle up to 100 avatars at uh, 96 uh, K, uh, BPS and um, in stereo with a, a, a very good uh, sampling rate. And we got that set up on the Chapel Hill Island. If you want to stop by my office, we can, I can show you what, what we have set up for that. And, and on the Chapel Hill Island, we can broadcast the whole island, right? Because when we were setting it up, Larry was over on the bell tower, and I was in Forest Theater, I think. Yeah. And talking to him real time. And when Skype comes, uh, then there'll be all sorts of interesting possibilities there. Yes. Are there anything like nature reserves or? I imagine there are. I think it. Oh, yeah, there are rainforests. There are, are special uh, uh, places that have various environments with animals. Uh, sometimes the animals even talk to you. Um, and 
One thing that I, I've noticed that, uh, like say the, uh, the journal, I think it's called uh, Library and Schools, uh, this January had an article on how they're using Second Life, especially Teen Second Life, to teach uh, geometry. I mean, imagine you could, you, could, you could put rays out there and show exactly how geometry works, but it's just by using the, uh, these prim building tools. Um, they, they also uh, are able to get the kids involved in, in real simulations that are very engaging. And, and there are many articles that are coming out in a lot of the journals uh, showing the possibilities. So I think we have about, Alan, you had one final question. Yeah, yeah. when I was uh, first messing around with Second Life, there was a, a big thing where there was this thing called the like copy bot, which allowed ever, and someone to copy any primitive or <coughs> set of primitives into something else. Um, and I remember there's a big hubbub of that where people were able to steal anything from anyone. Um, so what kind of stuff happens with that and has that gone away or? I was too new in Second Life time to understand what was going on, I'm sure. Larry, uh, right? It was very hot a couple, three months ago and um, that is like the kiss of death. If the Lindens find out you have a copy bot running, you know, you're, you're out for good, I'm sure. Um, I haven't heard any hubbub about it lately, though. No, so uh, maybe they're getting it under control, but that would certainly tend to destroy the economy of Second Life because if you put in a lot of work in, in making you know, a flexi dress that looks really great, and then somebody could just you know with a copy bot copy it and then distribute it, then you know, what's the incentive for you to do that? Um, if I could just you know kind of wrap this up, like I said, one of the things we wanted to do was get a community of interest around Second Life. Um, to help us find out what we want to uh, understand about Second Life <coughs> from the perspective of the UNC CH community. So, um, my name is Kathy Kaiser, Kathy underscore Kaiser, both of K's, K Y Z E R, at unc.edu. I'd love to hear from anybody who's interested. And, Libby, I think you've got everybody's email addresses that we can yes. send up. Yes. We can send a, a, an email out to everybody, and it's going to be good to just reply to that. Um, I don't remember what else I was going to say. Oh, I was going to um, get a, a bibliography together, and then I realized that everything you need to know is at secondlife.com, including um, a link to the education resources. I subscribe to the Second Life Educators List. It is, I don't, it's very, very, very demographic. <coughs> you know, 100 messages a day, maybe. Um, I kind of just scan them and see if any of the subject lines um, look interesting, but I get so much good information from that list. But um, like I said, if you go to secondlife.com, nearly anything you want, need to know, you'll find there. Links, resources, whatever. So, any other closing remarks, Larry or Charlie? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much.